Hey guys, welcome back. For today's video, I wanted to rehash one that I made around the same time last year when version 3 came out, ranking each element from worst to best. A lot has happened from 2022 to now coming in almost 2024, and I thought it would be good to make an updated version since we now had over a year of Dendro being in the game plus new characters, especially with Fontaine bringing us some very interesting ones that are bound to shake up the meta. Not only that, but seeing as our ranking videos are mostly subjective, my opinion of the elements has changed a lot as well. So if you think this video will be largely the same as the old one, you're in for quite a surprise. In any case, without further ado, let's get started. Just before we get to the list, I want to ask all of you Genshin mobile players out there how many of you dislike the touch controls for the game? I can't be the only one, right? That's mostly why I like to play on PC, because it's a lot better than just playing with two thumbs. Well, that's where today's sponsor comes into play, Backbone. Backbone is a peripheral device that allows you to effectively turn your smartphone into a portable gaming device almost like an Xbox or PlayStation controller. It basically lets you play Genshin with the usage of buttons and a control stick rather than having to touch on screen, and using Backbone's remote play you can also hook it up to console and PC too. Additionally, the Backbone app allows you to record, edit, and upload clips, receive notifications when friends log in, and instantly pick up where you left off in a game. Although I should specify that editing and uploading clips is only through the use of their membership service Backbone Plus, offering extra features, free perks, in-game items, and discounts to boot. I think it's a really cool device that gives you a better gaming experience for certain mobile games where just two thumbs don't cut it, like Genshin. It feels almost like having Joy-Cons, but for your phone. If you're interested in trying this out for yourself, use my link in the description below and get your hands on one of them. They have an Xbox and PlayStation variant, depending on what buns you want, but it's basically the same thing. Thanks again to Backbone for sponsoring the video, but for now, back to talking about the elements. While technically not an element, I feel like it warrants enough merit to at least be considered, although maybe it might be for the best if we just pretend it never existed to save embarrassment. The physical element at this point is nothing but a pipe dream. Despite the inclusion of Mika back in spring of 2023, almost nothing has been done to elevate or even change the current situation of physical. With Eula still serving as the Elder Stateswoman, it's clear there needs to be major changes to the player base to ever consider re-establishing any attention to the archetype on account of the equity of elemental reactions only having increased over the past year. Currently, we're seeing a resurgence of hypercare units, a class of characters that Eula is indeed a part of. And while she's always been infamous for her staggering screenshot burst numbers, the rise of hypercarries will do the opposite of give her newfound attention. It might take what little she has left. The only way I can see physical being anything other than last place on the rankings is if either 1. we get a completely new generation of physical characters, or 2. Genshin reworks physical to have more innate privileges than elements to make up for their inability to further increase physical damage through other means, whereas elements can. It's similar to how Linny and Nivellet need a higher baseline to offset their less reaction-centric DPS. In other words, they just had to make physical units and physical as a whole much stronger at base to be on par with everyone else, like it used to be. The first real element to be on the rankings and still holding dead last by quite a margin is going to be Geo. Like physical, Geo 2 is plagued by its insularity, being unable to interface with the other elements to boost its offensive capability, forcing its units to look from within their own roster for strength. Fortunately, there's a lot more internal support that can make his top dog Ito fare somewhat competently with sufficient investment, but that's hardly saying much in this day and age, as Mono Geo has fallen off considerably from an off-meta viable strategy to now outclassed by dozens of team compositions. Depending on when you see this, Navia is en route to grace us with their presence in a couple months, and based on speculation, there's a strong indication that she'll be revitalizing the Geo element from her own abilities and or changes to the element on a system-wide level, which is initially what made me want to wait to make this video, but I seriously doubt it's going to make that much of an impact given Geo's current predicament. The whole notion of Geo incentivizing birds of a feather flocking together fundamentally contrasts with Genshin's core gameplay aspect being mixing and matching elements together. Granted, we just had our first foray into a non-Geo mono-element character in the form of Linny, who was successfully executed on a majority pirate team comp, but even he allows you to flex one character slot of a different element. One could argue that you could do the same for Geo by adding Bennett for attack boost, Draven for Ina, or Yelan for a damage boost. But conceptually, being unable to form any meaningful synergy with the other elements greatly holds back what would otherwise be a very enticing alternative premise to approaching combat. I for one find the Geo construct mechanic to raise many interesting questions on using player instantiated terrain and whatnot to your advantage. Of course, for them to pull this off with practical gain, they have to grant the elements some concessions, which they've done in the past, but they'll have to give them a lot more. So here's hoping Navia will address those concerns in the coming months. Now, for the next three elements I'll be going over, I'd like to first preface by saying that all three of them are significantly more effective and usable than the preceding two. Ultimately, I will be ranking them in a set order, which implies one is superior to the other, which is superior to the other. However, from this point onward, it really comes down to one's interpretation of the strengths of an element, such as if it should also include aspects that aren't directly involved with the element in question, artifacts, weapons, or niche interactions and whatnot, or if you want to look at it from a utility point of view, a DPS point of view, difficulty, what have you. Either way, bear in mind that the next three elements placements are definitely negotiable depending on what criteria we assess them with. Cryo will take the 6th place spot. 
Considered one of the better performing elements in the past, due in no small part to Chain Freeze completely trivializing the difficulty of most content, the inclusion of Dendro as well as many of Spiral Abyss chambers featuring boss enemies that can't be frozen has caused the cryo elements to lose market share throughout most of version 3. Presently, it's still being held up by Ayaka and Ganyu who are still more than capable of finding gainful employment with adequate investment, especially if you're in possession of Shunhe whose cryo-enhancing faculty is almost essential for their performance in this day and age. While Cryo does have access to other reactions, Freeze is, and has always been the big sibling among all of them, with Melt coming in at a close second. Freeze is one job, and in its defense, still does it rather competently, prevent enemies from doing anything. With many of its units having persistent application in fairly large areas, you can often tear through entire waves of enemies without them landing a single hit on you. There's just one problem. It's a universal rule across all video games regardless of genre that the single most effective form of crowd control is death. After all, the enemy team can pose a threat to you if you kill them first, right? That's the current problem with Cryo at the moment. Most players have basically foregone Chain Freeze teams, not for its ineffectiveness, but because rather than making it impossible for them to hit you, you could just kill them faster. Dendro's very clearly established a far higher damage floor than what was once possible, and though it just got a new Cryo faster in the form of Risley, he doesn't really expand on Cryo that much to really change the element's condition. That being said, Cryo's still good, it's objectively good, but relatively, it's average. So despite having a 6th place spot, it really boils down to what content you're facing and what you prioritize. Like I said, if done correctly, Chain Freeze is one of the best teams in the game by virtue of having zero chance of failure. It might not win you any awards in terms of speed, but it's one of the easiest teams to autopilot through since enemies literally can't do anything. Pyro comes in next, having once dominated the meta in tandem with Cryo in version 1 and most of version 2, the element has fallen off considerably in version 3, supplanted by its rival DPS element Electro thanks to no shortage of help from Dendro. In fairness, Pyro is in the midst of sort of a resurgence and has always managed to hang on by relying on its different reaction-centric teams. In terms of its characters, it's basically Bennett and Shangling the element, but at that point how much of that should be attributed to Pyro and how much of that should be attributed to the innate strengths of those two units. That is to say, Pyro didn't exactly fall off if we go by character usage, but it's no longer the instant go-to option for dealing damage like it used to be. And in my video on Pyro, I summarized that the greatest problem the element currently faces is that it's all about damage, but every other element can also do damage, making it hard for Pyro to really stand out when it has nothing else going for it besides Bennett and Shangling. On the plus side, it's among the most straightforward elements in the game, with its units consisting of damage dealers and therefore establishing a clear win condition to the player. Vaporize has only gotten better and more consistent with Yelan finalizing the double hydro team, and we've also had new expansions to the element with mono pyro teams coming into play. So overall, the element's not doing too bad. It's no longer ubiquitous like it used to be since we now have plenty of other non-pyro oriented options, but reactions like Overlord and Burchin have also allowed it to stay afloat in that department as well. Teams like Child International, Ride and National, Double Hydro, Overvape, and Monopyro have given the element enough equity to stay relevant in the current meta. But one downside that I'm speculating will come to bite it back in the long term will be unit diversity. Given that it's mainly focused on damage, it's kind of difficult to make new pyro units that don't appear to challenge the existing cast. New pyro characters can and likely will begin to cannibalize old pyro units in light of the element being solely focused on power, whether exerting it or increasing it, meaning if it wants to improve, it might come at the expense of the previous generation of pyro units, which won't be a pleasant outcome for fans of said characters. Moving on though, we have Electro. Electro has been comfortably enjoying its newfound limelight and has no intentions of stepping aside anytime soon. Speaking purely from a damage perspective, it's now more than a match for Pyro and more often than not the superior option, boasting a very strong and respectable lineup of units like Shogun, Miko, Official, Shinobu, Kutsing, and Beidou, it's surprisingly top heavy, having more good characters and bad ones. Most if not all of this can be attributed to its interactions with Dendro, but even before that, Electro has been slowly creeping up over time. Taser has always been a very cost-effective team strategy, and stuff like Overvape with teams like Raiden National enables a once bad reaction to perform quite well. Not only that, but similarly to Pyro, Electro is known for having very strong individual characters. Yaimiko, Official, and Shinobu offering varying forms of Electro application from fast, concentrated single target, to periodic application, to area-focused coverage, and their numbers are generally quite good too. Kuting has also finally found a use case for a fast application, as we've long moved past the notion of one big screen nuke for DPS. Quantity can now be just as important as quality. One advantage Electro is capitalized on is that it's more open-ended, whereas Cryo and Pyro have very defined forms of utility. Utility can be represented as damage amplification to units like Sara and Shogun, or it can be represented as application like Miko, Official, and Beidou. This enables the element to have many high-performing units that don't overlap with each other, therefore not having to compete for attention. That's of course thanks to Hyperbloom incentivizing periodic application while Aggravate and Taser want rapid application, so there are more ways for Electro to express offense. 
Overall, it's in a good spot. Certainly far from being the best element out there, but nowhere near the worst like it used to be back in version 1. Though that's not to say it doesn't come with any issues. Of the three damage-oriented elements, it's by far the most reliant on reaction support, making the prospect of a non-reaction-based Electro Hyper Carry quite difficult to theorize, even though we do have Kujo Sada who can facilitate that kind of playstyle. I wouldn't go so far as to argue it holds the element back, but much of Electro's success is based on reactions, making its individuality less pronounced. Although, Clorinde looks like she has something to say about that in the coming future, and so far Fontaine has expressed a penchant for hyper carries. So before we continue, I want to reiterate that Cryo, Pyro, and Electro's placements are very tight. You can easily make a case that one is better than the other based on your own preferences. I just ultimately settle for that order based on mine. The next three, however, are definitively a cut above the rest. Starting with Animo, previously holding the crown of first place, it has since fallen to third place with an argument for the silver medal depending on once again what your priorities are. Animo will always be in the top half of any element rankings no matter what, since it does stuff that no other element can do, and unlike Geo, that stuff is actually conducive towards efficient combat. The reason it was far and away the best in the past was that the offensive augmentation afforded by its characters was not only irreplaceable but the highest in value. Veritas and Venerer was practically obligatory for any teams involving the four swirl elements no matter what, with this 40% shred far surpassing any other support's breaking capabilities at that time. In addition, elemental mastery sources were few and far between as well, leaving you with just Kasuha and Sucrose to supply you with. However, nowadays, there are many other damage boosting supports and or teams that have more stringent body slot allocation. For instance, we now have units like Yelan who can boost your total damage unconditionally, and Nahida who can also offer elemental mastery. Furthermore, Animo's other source of utility being crowd control has become less and less necessary over time. Many modern day teams have far more range and coverage than the teams of old, and it only appears to be getting more generous at that. So while crowd control is still very helpful, Animo is no longer the only way you can access it. Likewise, damage amplification sources are more plentiful nowadays, in contrast to back then where VV was the creme de la creme. On the plus side, version 3 brought in a new potential case for Animo being the bride this time around instead of its usual role as the bridesmaid. The inclusion of Farazan has allowed Shao and Wander to become quite possibly the strongest hyper carries in the game if we go by the absolute peak of what they can do, something I was made aware of over the past few months. So there's always room for them to expand in that direction, and even if they don't, Animo's utility is still extremely valuable. It's no longer inflated by being the only option, but that in no way diminishes its usefulness. Units like Venti, Kasaha, and Sucrose have been effortlessly holding up the element for all these years, and they don't seem to be tiring out anytime soon. Second best element in the game is unsurprisingly Dendro, and for good reason too. It set a new standard for damage in Genshin Impact. It is the meta right now. Anything and everything that comes hereafter will be and has to be evaluated against the damage floors of Quicken and Hyper Bloom purely because of how strong and easily accessible those floors are. It's the second element to have many of its units derive strength from Elemental Mastery. Conveniently, its reactions have among the best Elemental Mastery multipliers in the game, allowing it to inflict huge amounts of damage without even trying. Moreover, it's among the most consistent reactions as well. For example, if you're running a Quicken team, it doesn't really matter whether you proc Aggravate or Spread since they ultimately do the same amount of damage buying VV Shred, so you can just Turbo Spam Electro and Dendro together and achieve the same result. Throughout version 3, Mihoyo has done a great job expanding on the roster and giving us ample sources of everything we need for the element, allowing for a very balanced and robust assortment of characters. We have our damage dealers through all hate them in Tignati, our supports like Nahida, Kale, Kirara, and DMC, and then our healers in the form of Yao Yao and Baizu. All things considered, the element's roster is in a very good spot and can easily survive on just the ones I've listed even if no new Dendro characters come out for the entirety of version 4. Dendro really doesn't have any serious downsides to it. As far as elements go, it's the very best at what it does, and what it does currently faces no situation in which it's not effective. It may have a slightly more demanding investment floor since you need more specific units than other teams, but in general, whether it's single target or multi-target, Dendro is the benchmark for which all other damage dealers are weighed against. I just find it funny that the youngest looking Archon of the 5 happens to be one of the most powerful in-game. Although, now that Farina has been released, Nahida may have met her match. But even so, the element wouldn't be anywhere near as strong as it is if Nahida wasn't as overpowered as she is. And personally, I'm of the school of thought that Archons are meant to serve as a paragon of what their element is capable of. And, if Nahida is any indication of the full extent of what Dendro can do, then that can only mean Hydro is without question, with no caveat, no asterisk, beyond any semblance of doubt, the best element in Genshin Impact. It does everything. It's involved in every single critical reaction in the entire game. Cryo's most important reaction, Freeze. Pyro's most important reaction, Vaporize. Dendro's most important reaction, Hyper Bloom. Electro's most important reaction, technically also Hyper Bloom, but for the sake of variety, Electro Charge. It has some of if not the best supports in the game for every supportive need imaginable. All thanks to the current trinity of Hydro supports, Kokomi, Xingqiu, and Yelan, who each have great universal Hydro application while also specializing in their own fields. Moreover, their on-field candidates, Child, Ayato, and especially Novelite, can push the offensive capabilities of said reactions to impressive heights. 
Unlike the other elements which have been pushed down by Dendro, Hydro has only gotten stronger, the advent of Bloom only compounding the need for Hydro application, and with the release of Nilu creating a unique style of Bloom teams that rank among one of the strongest teams in the game. Hydro is the only element in the game with absolutely no weakness or downside to speak of, and to think, this was all achieved before Nivellet and Farina came out. With the Hydro Archon finally gracing us with their exquisite moveset, Hydro will likely never be knocked off its throne for the rest of Genshin's timeline. Like the Archons that came before her, she epitomizes the Hydro element, doing almost everything you would want from a Hydro character, and most importantly, having significant room to continue getting better. That's why I think Hydro will never not be the best element. Whatever direction the meta goes, whatever shape it takes, Hydro, and by extension its units, will mold itself into that shape. Suffice to say, there's nothing more that needs to be said, fitting that water is the most powerful element in the game considering it is the source of all life, so it makes perfect sense for it to be what drives anything and everything in this game. Offensive utility, defensive utility, damage, sustained coverage, reactions, everything. Hydro takes all elements beneath it and does their jobs better than they do. In fact, I'd go so far as to say one of the most prevailing reasons Geo and Physical are so trash is because they don't have a worthwhile interaction with Hydro, but that's a conspiracy theory for another time. And that concludes our updated ranking of each element. Let me know your thoughts on my order in the comments down below whether you agree or disagree with my choices. Aside from that though, if you enjoyed the video, it would be awesome if you gave it a like and subscribed. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at VarsFam, join my Discord server, and check out my element mini series if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.